media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, recycling trade publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Welcome to the Goddard Report. Comments made on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com are an expression of opinion only. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Jordan Bateman, Vice President of Communications and Marketing for the Independent Contractors and Business Association in B.C. His website, icba.ca. Welcome back to the show, Jordan. Thanks for having me, Jim. Jordan, B.C.'s NDP government announcing their plans to replace the Massey Tunnel, which has been a choke point for traffic in B.C., which has always been a choke point as far as uh, for as long as I've lived here since 1982. Is it going to get any better under their plan? <laughs> if you're uh, holding your breath for a uh, better uh, George Massey solution, uh, please don't. You'll expire uh, quickly here. Uh, the announcement today was extremely disappointing uh, in, in a lot of regards. First of all, we need to cast our mind back to 2017. Christy Clark had announced a new 10-lane bridge would be built there. They were doing the preload, spent about $100 million getting it ready, um, and it was going to be open by 2022, so next year. Uh, the NDP come in, and for no real reason other than the fact that they didn't want to leave Christy Clark with a you know signature project, they canceled that, and then we were stuck in limbo from 2017 until today. Today they announced that they're going to not build a bridge, they'll build a tunnel, replacement tunnel, um, and it will be eight lanes uh, instead of the current uh, four-lane tunnel, which, you know, you might be saying, hey, that's twice the size, that's fantastic. The problem is the current tunnel has the um, switchable lane over uh, during um, rush hour, which means you have three lanes going one way. This new bridge, or this new tunnel, pardon me, is going to have uh, four lanes going that way, except one is dedicated only to rapid bus. No uh, cars will be allowed in it, um, only uh, thus leaving, you know, again, three lanes going through in rush hour. It's just a remarkably short-sighted project, um, a bad decision by the NDP. And, and here's the kicker. It's going to cost way more money, $4.2 billion, and it's not going to be ready until 2030, which is just a staggering amount of time on this. So we could have had a 10-lane uh, a bridge very similar to the Port Man, uh, in operation next year for something. Now, what's going to, why is it going to take so long for this project to be completed? I thought BC had some of the most efficient construction workers in the world. <laughs> it's not the construction workers that are holding it up. It's the government that's holding it up. So there's two kind of layers to it. Um, the Clark Bridge had uh, all of its environmental approvals in place. And, and frankly, it was easier to get them than for a tunnel because uh, you're just talking about a few pilings, I think actually only two in the actual Fraser River itself, um, whereas this project's going to need massive environmental uh, review because uh, you're talking about putting another uh, tunnel into the, the riverbed. Um, so environmental review, they're thinking it's going to take up to three and a half years to get all their environmental permits for this project. And that's on top of you know having to work with the indigenous groups who under... Uh, the United Nations uh, Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People, do have a, a significant say in this. And Tawasin First Nation, uh, up till now, has been pretty clear that they want they prefer to bridge to a tunnel for the environmental reasons. So, uh, yeah, it's not the construction workers that take too long. Uh, in fact, they're almost the quickest part of this process. It's government, it's bureaucracy, it's red tape, it's uh, obstinate political decision makers who uh, would prefer to drag this out than... Uh, and build it quickly. Does a tunnel restrict the size of ships that can use the waterway? Well, apparently it's going to be the same as uh, it is today, so it's not going to expand the shipping at all. Um, but, you know, it, it, just, it restricts a number of things. First of all, by having that choke point remain, we need to remember the U.S. border, the ferries, Delta port. Those three key economic uh, drivers are all south of that tunnel. And they use that tunnel to get through to Richmond, which is where the international airport is, along with a number of businesses, and then eventually into Vancouver. So by continuing to choke traffic there at rush hour, uh, you're not making anything better 
for you know the the big investment drivers, the big um, you know ec- economic drivers in the region. Uh, you know, so you know, put the commuters aside, which is you know we shouldn't do because <laughs> you're losing uh, tons of money and productivity of workers and people who are just waiting around in traffic bottlenecks. But you're also uh, damaging again, you know, the ability of Delta ports and, and BC ferries to generate uh, generate revenue and investment and keep people moving uh, quickly. Can they put rapid transit into that tunnel? Well, here's the other very annoying part of this: is the ten lane bridge. Uh, that Clark had uh, had approved was going to include a provision where eventually um, the transit lane could be converted to either light rail or SkyTrain. So looking ahead and saying, hey, you know, sometime in the next 50 years or whatever the lifespan of this bridge is going to be, we're going to have, uh, we're going to want to invest in rapid transit of the rail variety. That has been stripped out of this. This tunnel uh, will only have a bus rapid transit lane. They specifically said it will not be able to handle uh, future trains, and certainly not SkyTrain. So again, another short-sighted you know thing done to save costs to try to get it down to a number somewhat approaching what the Clark Bridge would have cost. Um, but instead, you're just you know, if you've ever been annoyed by short-term planning um, and and lack of capacity for roads, hospitals, schools, whatever, this is prime example number one of short-term planning. Instead of going big, making sure it could take uh, you know handle the traffic that's going to be generated over the next 50 years, make sure it can handle the uh, goods and services that need to move over it, make sure it can handle transit, uh, and offering the most attractive transit options possible, they instead are cheaping out, going small, you know, doing the bare minimum to try to you know, satiate public demand. Now, I thought rapid transit was the wave of the future if you wanted to help the environment. Yeah, not in uh, south of the Fraser, apparently. They still want to stick you on uh, bus, rapid buses. Now, look, rapid buses have their role in transit systems, certainly today when it's expensive to put in rail. But at some point, you want to upgrade to trains. Like, at some point, you want to have enough, um, attract enough people to use transit to move them over to a train system. And, and that is uh, very disappointing. Here's the other frustrating thing for me. We're getting so much less, but paying so much more. So the Clark Bridge um, had a budget envelope of three and a half billion dollars. The first bids were coming in, and some of them were nine hundred million dollars under that envelope. So you know there was one bid for two point six billion. Now even if that had gone thirty percent over, it still would have been in within the three and a half billion dollar uh, budget envelope. This bridge or this tunnel, pardon me, that the NDP announced today, it's going to cost four point one five billion. And that's today's dollars. Who knows what it'll actually be by the time they start construction in four or five years, by the time this thing is actually built in eight to ten years. Um, very frustrating to see um, them throw away that money uh, and then provide a product that is far, uh, you know, much worse than the one that they canceled in 2017. We'll have more with Jordan Bateman right after this. Media recognition from Bloomberg, Writers, Recycling Trade Publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Jordan Bateman. Jordan, with the federal election campaign on, is there anything the politicians should be focusing on in B.C. to help improve our economy? Well, yeah, there's a lot of things. First of all, you know, we talked about red tape during the Massey Tunnel segment. Anything we can do to make uh, project approval speed up uh, to attract more investment to British Columbia would be a good thing. And, uh, you know, uh, we rank 65th in Canada you know, on the OECD rankings of how long it takes to get a permit for a project, uh, a simple project. 65th is not good enough. We've got to find a way to cut through that red tape because investment is avoiding Canada now and going elsewhere. The other thing is, They've got to do more for, you know, small business owners, but also they need to understand, like, the damage and the looming risk 
of you know increasing inflation rates, so essentially reducing people's purchasing power, and, and also you know what massive government debt will actually mean. You know the debt now is 1.1 trillion dollars. Trillion is a number we used to use to describe the U.S. debt, not you know uh, little Canada's debt. Um, but yet you know under the Trudeau government, 1.1 trillion, and the provincial or the parliamentary budget office says, hey, you're not going to actually have a balanced budget at this rate until the year 2070. You know, we have to do better than a 50-year plan to balance the budget. And I know that's going to take some financial um, restraint. It's going to take saying no to some things. It's going to take innovative ways to grow the economy in order to generate more revenue for uh, government. Uh, but we need to do all of those things instead of just kicking the can down the road because we're at the point now with the trillion dollars in debt that even the historically low interest rates we are paying are causing us to pay 25, 30, 50 billion dollars a year in interest. And, you know, that's money that should be going to public services, should be going to uh, infrastructure that instead we're just paying to bankers. Now, all of these uh, parties are promising to shovel more taxpayer money out to individuals or to programs. The only one I've heard who's talked about letting you keep more of your money and deciding where you want to spend it is Maxime Bernier. He wants to up the personal exemption. Nobody else is talking about doing that, letting you keep more money before you have to pay federal tax. Yeah, it seems like the income tax is getting a free ride right now as far as uh, you know scrutiny goes. I think governments are very sensitive to not wanting to tie their hands as far as reducing um, tax revenues because they do realize they're in such massive debt. But, you know, again, these political parties need to come out what frustrates me is Justin Trudeau's, you know, reasoning or public reasoning for calling this election was, you know, we need to make sure that Canadians are on board for our plan to help the economy recover, how to build back better, blah, blah, blah. Now, of course, you know, Jim, you and I are jaded political observers over the years. We know it was really about Justin Trudeau getting the uh, majority government he so desperately craves and the stability of another four years in power. It wasn't really about this. But let's take him out of his word. Let's say, okay, it is about building back better. None of these parties seem to have a great plan for, to do that. And certainly nothing innovative, um, certainly nothing that's going to pour gasoline on the economy and get it firing on all cylinders again. Um, you know, it, it's still early days in the election, but I want to see a whole lot more out of all the parties as to you know, how they're actually going to you know, make sure people have more money in their pocket, make sure there's more jobs for folks to work at, and how to attract more investment and opportunity to British Columbia specifically and to Canada as a whole. Uh, Jordan, anything else we should be keeping an eye on right now? Well, yeah, there's still the forest fire issue in, oh, yeah. into the interior of British Columbia, and that is a big concern. And I can tell you it's front of mind for a lot of construction companies, a lot of residents uh, across British Columbia, um, things have calmed down slightly since Sunday, but we are by no means um, through the worst of this storm. So, uh, you know, that is having an effect on the economy, certainly having an effect on uh, tourism uh, in those areas. And it's having an effect, I think, on brand BC. You know, at some point, we want to throw open the doors of British Columbia back to the rest of Canada and the rest of North America to come and visit. And if brand BC is smoky skies, um, forest fires, uh, evacuations, things like that, um, that is very bad for BC long term. So, you know, the provincial government needs, need, needs to do a better job of uh, being aware and present and, and trying to reduce the risk of these fires and reduce the impact when they do happen. Um, and at the same time, um, you know, we're thinking a lot about our uh, our members and, and our uh, their workers who are out in these regions who are dealing with the fear of losing their home or losing their town to these wildfires. It's been a an extraordinarily difficult summer for them, and, and certainly anything we can do to help them, we're, we're trying to do. Two resources not being used, the Martin Mars water bomber still sitting on Sprott Lake on Vancouver Island. Uh, they're not going to fix it unless they get a government contract, and the government will give them one. It puts out four acres of fire at, at a time, and uh, its record is uh, 10 drops in one hour, and it drops the equivalent of 8 to 10 fire trucks worth of water at a time. Also, there's a, a company in, in the interior that can lay down uh, big hoses like the fire uh, departments use around a town or a specific area and put up giant sprinklers to protect it. That's not being used. And our premier is not in B.C. during the height of forest fire season. He's enjoying clean air on the East Coast. 
Uh, three things uh, that people are talking about right now during the forest fire season. Yeah, you're exactly right. You know, we need to muster every resource. I'll give you another one. Uh, my understanding is a number of integrated RCMP units have been uh, redeployed across the province to help, uh, you know, keep control of security, you know, keep towns safe while they've been evacuated, and basically do the things uh, to free up the firefighters to go and actually fight the blazes. Many of these integrated units have Vancouver Police Department officers, um, you know, other communities, Delta, Abbotsford, municipal police force um, folks. They are not being redeployed there. They are not joining their units up uh, up country, and it comes, seems to come down to an insurance issue. Um, you know, the RCMP or the federal government or whoever, the provincial government, will not lay down who would be responsible um, if a catastrophic injury happened to one of these uh, municipal police officers. So instead of just working through that and saying, you know, the province will cover or RCMP will cover or whoever, um, they're, those police officers are staying home um, while their units are elsewhere. We've got to do a better job of mustering resources to this. Like This is an all-hands-on-deck situation for British Columbia, and I don't think the NDP have done a very good job of uh, making sure that uh, every resource possible is uh, being put in the hands of these firefighters and these communities that so desperately need it. I've been told by uh, the owner of a major water flying water tanker company that BC is employing 1950s tactics to fight forest fires, they're not using computer simulation models that tell them where and when to use resources like other countries like Australia are doing. Really? I, that, that bothers I, I was unaware of that, and I certainly take you and your friend at your word, but that's, that's mind-boggling. Like, let's get... We should be on the cutting edge of this. Listen, I, like, one thing about climate change that a conclusion I've come to in, in recent months and years is that Nothing we can do is really going to reverse or stop climate change. Nothing we do in British Columbia. We're just such a minor bit player in the overall scheme of things. China and India really are, are what's driving it. And yes, we can help by doing LNG and stopping a few coal plants in China and whatnot, but we're never going to be able to reverse it. So instead, we need to be investing in mitigation. Like, it's coming. We need to know how to handle it and handle it better. And I think, you know, wildfires is a great example of that. You know, most scientists trace wildfire, uh, the increase in wildfires to climate change. You know, we've known this is coming for a long time. Now we need to modernize our systems, clear out forest floors, do whatever it takes to try to protect um, life and, and property. Um, it, it's time to move into the mitigation stage in our battle against climate change. Well, BC gets a load of precipitation in the wintertime. How come we're not building little moats around our communities to stop fires from happening? They'd be cute. You can have little canal rides around your town and and prevent fires as well. Uh, you know, little projects like that. We have the water to do it. Or how come we don't have water reservoirs, uh, you know, set aside uh, higher up on towns because BC is mountainous that could be used to fight fires without using power and would automatically sprinkle that town? You know, it's a project to provide jobs. It, your insurance rates would fall, all, all those things. I think there's a very big lack of imagination to fight this problem, and what's more, no political will to do it. Is anybody saying there should be an inquiry with uh, hard standards to be met, hard questions to be asked and answered, and hard solutions? Because it seems every year it's like the forest fires are a big surprise, and oh my God, what do we do now? It's like flooding on the prairies. We know Manitoba is going to be flooded every spring, yet they always seem to be shocked, stunned, and amazed that it happens. <laughs> Uh, exactly. You're right. I, was it Doug McCallum, Mayor of Surrey, who uh, suggested a canal? Was it down 152nd or something like that? Um, I don't know if that would help with the forest fires. <laughs> <laughs> Look, er everything should be on the table as far as, as what we're doing, but you know, it, it starts with proper modeling, proper understanding of you know our vulnerable points, and you know, are we making sure that the resources are available? And I don't know how, you know. I just compare the response every year to forest fires to the response that we put into COVID. And, you know, I think there's more that we can do. And, um, you know, I, I'm betting that the folks living uh, or who used to live in Lytton, betting the folks who live in Logan Lake uh, would agree with me that there's a lot more that could be done to keep uh, our forest safe. But they must be totally disappointed 
knowing that there's a portable fire prevention system that could have been deployed in their towns that wasn't used, they must be disappointed that the Martin Mars that puts out four acres of fire at a time wasn't used. Yeah, no, I totally agree. These are the things that we need to be to be grabbing and, and using and, and the things that we need to hold the government to account for. Why, you know, why did they make the choices not to use these things? Um, absolutely, you're, you're absolutely correct. I know the argument against the Martin Mars is it costs $120,000 an hour to operate, but no aircraft in the world delivers more water per hour on a fire. And BC is the only place in the world that calculates the cost per hour, not the cost per liter of water put on the fire. Hmm. Hmm. That's a that's a very good point. And, you know, again, another example of where BC is using old metrics and uh, maybe not paying attention to, you know, the modern way of uh, judging how these things work. Look, I... I'm going to be level, I'm going to level with you. I ain't a wildfire expert, and certainly not a forest fire fighting expert, but I'm going to judge it on results. And this year's results have been abysmal. Um, entire communities, highways closed, uh, lit and lost. Um, you know, I don't know if the Mars bomber would have worked there or not. Well, I'm thinking you know, Canada if it should... releases other resources to that area, then let's do it. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, Canada should be building the modern equivalent of these Martin Mars water bombers because these little pontoon crop dusting planes certainly don't seem to be working when their water evaporates before it hits the fire. Yeah, no, you're exactly. Yeah, so why isn't Canada building these things? A- and make it a federal priority because every province every year has a forest fire crisis of some kind. Make it a natural resource, and if Canada doesn't need it, then other countries, look at Greece this year, is on fire. Uh, you know, it could be an international product. Yep. You know, instead of making business jets, why isn't Bombardier making water bombers instead? So great points all around and, and certainly worthy of Because they're money. using taxpayer money to build their, their little airplanes right now mm-hmm. to, to scoot the millionaires around. Why, why not put it to use for taxpayers? I, I totally agree. I totally agree. Jordan, Jim, you know, Jim, Jim Goddard for prime minister. Where do I sign up? Uh, yeah, I just want to be the benevolent dictator of the universe. <laughs> <laughs> so, so kind of a uh, Pierre Elliott Trudeau type uh, prime minister. Then. No, <laughs> no, I, I, my, my society really would be just. Um, <laughs> Jordan, thank you so much for chatting with us. Thanks for having me. Oh, oh by the way, uh, I always like to mention you're still looking for uh, skilled trades workers. Absolutely. Uh, ICBA.ca slash jobs. If you want to work in the trades, uh, we can get you a job within a week. Um, companies are desperate for workers right now. And uh, yeah, there's no no reason for you to be sitting at home unemployed. Uh, there's certainly work in construction. My guest has been Jordan Bateman, Vice President of Communications and Marketing for the Independent Contractors and Business Association. That website again, icba.ca. If you have any questions for Jordan or any of our other guests, you can send them to info at howstreet.com and we'll ask that question for you the next time we talk to him. Our YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. Find us on Twitter at Talk Digital Net. We're also on Facebook. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com are an expression of opinion only. The Goddard Report is available online and mobile at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. The Goddard Report is a production of How Street Media Incorporated.